Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Drew Lichtenberg, the resident dramaturg at the Shakespeare Theater Company, and welcome to Shakespeare Hour Live. It is May, and tonight is the first of two conversations that we will be having this May on the work of Thornton Wilder and Our Town in preparation for STC's upcoming production. Before we get started, a word of thanks to our generous sponsors. Uh, the Shakespeare Hour Live is made possible through the visionary support of the Beach Street Foundation and Shakespeare Theatre Company's 2021-22 season uh, is made possible by Michael R. Klein and Joan Fabry and the Harmon Family Foundation. So thank you uh, truly to our sponsors. Now, uh, let me introduce our panelists. Joining us tonight is Howard Sherman, a New York-based arts administrator, advocate, and writer. Howard has been executive director of the American Theater Wing and the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, managing director of Giva Theater Center, general manager of Goodspeed Musicals, and public relations director of Hartford Stage. He is a national expert on censorship in the theater, particularly at the high school level, and he has delivered numerous speeches to and conducted workshops for high school teachers on this very important subject. Uh, he has been the U.S. columnist for the Stage newspaper in London since 2012, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Slate, Stage Directions, Encore Monthly, The Guardian, and other August publications. He is also the recent author of his very first book, Another Day's Begun, Thornton Wilder's Our Town in the 21st Century, which was published in January of 2021 by Methuen Bloomsbury. His website is hesherman.com. Hello, Howard, are you there? Hello, Drew, I, I am here. Uh, and congratulations, if I may say, on having published your book. Uh, I have not read it yet, but I hear it's amazing. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> I hope you like it when you get to it. Yes, I, I can't wait. It's on my, uh, my to-do list. of I, I'm constantly accumulating books to read, and yours is on the, the large pile, uh, but at the top of the pile. Uh, and I'm curious, Howard, um, where are you uh, joining us from tonight? I'm joining you from Manhattan, the Upper West Side. Uh, well, well, it's always good to have uh, a person from New York, the center of the theater world in America, perhaps. Oh, uh, no, no. The theater world is everywhere. There is no single center. Uh, everywhere yeah. is as equal as everywhere else. Right. As we were saying before the show, uh, Thornton Wilder is having a renaissance right now, but Thornton Wilder is always having a renaissance, and the same goes for theater in America. Uh, thank you, Howard, for joining us. Also on the show is Alan Paul, STC's Associate Artistic Director, where he has most recently directed Patrick Page in All the Devils Are Here and Peter Pan and Wendy by Lauren Gunderson. Uh, Alan is a multiple-time Helen Hayes Award nominee for Best Director for his productions of The Comedy of Errors, The Man of La Mancha, and a Helen Hayes Award winner for A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. He has also directed some of STC's most successful shows ever including Camelot, Kiss Me Kate, and Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. Uh, regionally, Alan just directed The King and I at Chicago's Drury Lane Theater. In DC, he has directed The Pajama Game at Arena Stage, I Am My Own Wife at Signature Theater, Silence the Musical and Rocky Horror at Studio Theater's Second Stage, and he has directed operas at the Palm Beach Opera, the Portland Opera, the Washington National Opera, Urban Arias, In Series, Strathmore Concert Hall, Wolf Trap, and he was a finalist for the 2013 European Opera Directing Prize in Vienna, Austria. You can find all this and more at alanpauldirector.com. And most importantly, Alan is a four-time guest on the Shakespeare Hour Live, having previously appeared to discuss Shakespeare in musicals, West Side Story, and All the Devils Are Here. Those are all on our YouTube channel. You can go watch them as soon as you get done if you haven't had enough Shakespeare Hour content tonight. Uh, welcome, Alan, are you there? Hi, Drew. I'm so happy to be here. I'm and joining you from uh, the administrative offices of Shakespeare Theater on Capitol Hill. Um, and we've just finished a day of rehearsal for our town at seven o'clock. We were rehearsing the soda shop scene. Oh, uh, and you are uh, calling from the literal as well as the metaphorical green room. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> I hope it doesn't wash me out too much. No, no, no. I, I, we were saying before the before the show started, you have a kind of angelic uh, glow about you tonight. So I think it's very, very. I, I don't, according to the actors, but. 
Uh, well, speaking of which, uh, our third panelist is Craig Wallace, uh, one of the finest actors, in my opinion, in the DC area and in all of American theater. Craig has appeared in many shows at the Shakespeare Theater, theater Company, including Henry IV, Parts One and Two, The Government Inspector, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra. He has appeared in Death of a Salesman at Ford's Theater, A Doll's House Part Two at Roundhouse, District Merchants at Folger Theater, All the Way in the Great Society at Arena Stage, and many, many more. I could, I could go on and on. Uh, Craig is a teacher at STC's Academy of Classical Acting at the George Washington University, as well as Howard University, where he obtained his Bachelor of Fine Arts. Craig has also trained at Penn State University and the Royal National Theater in London. Craig, hello, are you there? There I am. Yes, I am. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Craig, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, sure. You must not be in the soda sh shop scene, so you're available to join us tonight. Is that right? That's right. That's right. I'm here. I'm at my home in uh, Northeast D.C. And uh, what character are you playing in this production of Our Town, if I may ask? I am Mr. Webb. Mr. Webb. Wonderful. Uh, can't wait to hear more about your uh, journey uh, playing Mr. Webb. And have you ever appeared in Our Town before, Craig? I have. I have. Ten years ago, I played Mr. Webb uh, at a production at Ford's Theater. Interesting. So it's, it's, it's your second time dancing with, with Mr. Webb, in a sense. Indeed. Uh, well, welcome all of our panelists. Can't wait to start the discussion. But last but certainly not least, I also want to introduce on camera tonight, monitoring the chat, Sierra Culbertson, STC's Development Coordinator. Hello, Sierra, are you there? Hi, Drew. Yes, I am here. And can I ask, uh, uh, have you ever been in a production of Our Town? Do you have a favorite character from Our Town? Do you have any associations with the play Our Town? Uh, Ooh, I have a big secret, and it's that I have never actually seen a production of Our Town before, despite having multiple de degrees in theater. So I am excited to see Alan's production. Well, uh, I am also very excited to see Alan's production. Uh, and I, my own secret is that I never saw a production until my, I think my second year of graduate school, when it was an acting project performed without a stage in a kind of billiards room uh, at the Yale School of Drama. And I was completely overwhelmed by the experience. I was unprepared. I was overwhelmed. And I think that might be a good way of getting into talking about our town now, because I, th I think many people have a set of associations or assumptions about the container uh, theatrically for our town. You know, it's set in Grover's Corners, New Hampshire in the early 20th century. The play itself was written in 1938 and was based on six summers that Thornton Wilder spent in that state, uh, teaching at the Lake Sunapee Summer School in Newberry and writing at the McDowell Colony. And it won the second of his three Pulitzer Prizes. It's sort of a classic of the American stage. Uh, but for those of you who may not have read Our Town in a while, I think of it as a very experimental play. It's really more like three one-act plays connected to each other. In the first act, we meet the inhabitants of Grover's Corners, this very specific kind of wasp community in New Hampshire, uh, from an anthropological point of view, relayed to us by a stage manager who speaks directly to the audience. Act two, as you were saying, Alan, really centers on this love story between George and Emily and the soda shop scene between them, I consider to be the Americana equivalent of the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, just as powerful, uh, just as romantic, just as moving in the theater. And then act three, well, I cannot adequately describe what happens in act three in our town. You simply have to see it and experience it in the theater. It is truly one of the most cosmic and metaphysical things you can experience, in my opinion, in the theater. So I'm curious, maybe starting with you, Howard, since your book is about our town in the 21st century, I'm curious to hear about how this book project started, because you were telling me it started as a biography of the play and then became something much more specific and maybe some of the discoveries that you made about the play and how this play has continued to be reinvented, restaged and reinterpreted in recent years. That's a tall order. The, the book came into being because I was trying to come up with an idea for a book and 
I think there's a lot of books about musicals. I don't think there are as many books about plays per se. And frankly, I thought, well, gosh, our town is awfully popular and it's an awfully good play. I can't say it was my favorite play when, when I went into it. And, and what surprised me was that I found a lot of books about Thornton Wilder, but I didn't find books about our town itself. To try to do a history of the play Our Town would be a staggering work that I could have never accomplished in my lifetime because there are simply so many productions and so many versions. So I looked for a way to, to sort of winnow down and say, how could I get at something with Our Town that, that I could get my arms around? And that came down to being these dozen oral histories of productions since the turn of the 21st century. And again, that was simply to help to, to confine the universe that, that I was exploring. And so it went really from the last Broadway production, which was the Westbrook Country Playhouse production with Paul Newman in 2002, and the most recent production uh, having been in 2019 at the Open Air Theater in Regent's Park in London. And I don't claim that these are in any way the best productions of our town. What I went for was the widest variety of approaches or experiences or people involved. And, and in a way, I think to myself, I could have probably picked 12 completely different productions of our town and come up with a different yet equally interesting book. But what was surprising was the number of people who said, when I came up with the idea, said, oh, well, our town, everybody knows our town. And, and Drew, you and Sarah both already proved that that's not really true. I think it is a very widely known, very widely read, very widely produced play. There's no question. But the assumption that everyone knows our town simply isn't accurate. And in fact, the one question I started every single one of the 115 interviews I did for the book with was, when did you first encounter our town? And the number of people who wanted to let me in on their secret, their confession, their admission was quite extraordinary because people do seem to almost feel guilty or like they missed out. And I, I'm someone who didn't see our town or read our town for the first time until I was 26 years old. So I don't think there's any great shame in it. We, we all have only so much time and we can only see the work that's produced near us. Uh, and as a result, it was a fascinating starting point because for every person who did say, oh, I read it when I was 15 and I just fell in love or, or I read it for the first time and I cried and I cried and I cried, there were plenty of people who, who said they didn't know it. And the number of people who admitted they didn't know it and assumed they knew what it was and didn't like it. That's, that's the other phenomenon. When you, talk about, when you talk about the metaphysics of Act Three, I think there's something, there's something um, remarkable about Act Three because I think Act Three brings up so much in the audience members who connect with it. I think they sort of forget it every time. If you ask people what they remember about our town, most of the time, they will talk to you about Acts 1 and 2, unless they saw a particularly vivid production, uh, not David Cromer's in 2010 being an example, where there was some particular solution, some particular innovation that, that brought it home for people. But, but by and large, they don't talk so much about Act 3. I think if we all remembered, or at least if I remembered fully, some of what I've experienced watching Act Three of Our Town, I'm not sure I could go to it over and over again because it really works on me in in a pretty remarkable way. So, so I think the discoveries were that it isn't something absolutely everyone knows. It isn't what people think it is, and it isn't what even people who know it tend to remember. And in that, there's opportunity. You know, you asked about why the 21st century. Well, first, I think all credit is due to Tap and Wilder, who administers the, the Wilder family LLC and controls the, the literary estate of Tap and Wilder. 
many estates are absolutely 100% doctrinaire that work must be done exactly the way it was done in the original Broadway production and on a work that may be 80 or 90 years old, nobody even actually remembers what it looked like in that production. So you end up with the 15th carbon copy. I think Tappan has been extraordinary in defending and deter making sure that his uncle's words are preserved, but that there are new ways and new approaches to get at the meaning of his uncle's words. And that's everything from um, not having all white casts, not having uh, always have an old white man playing the stage manager, uh, and, and even to violating the no curtain, no scenery words that, that open the play. There, there are certainly productions that have scenic elements, design elements, effects. Um, and as long as they're there in service of Thornton Wilder's words, I think that's what allows this play to live more so than, frankly, other than, and, and Drew, you're, you're, you're a dramaturg, you tell me, but, but I think other than the plays of O'Neill, I don't think there's anything else in the American canon that's been around as consistently, maybe a few Kaufman and Hart plays, as consistently as, as our town. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much, uh, obviously, to respond to, Howard, and thank you for, for offering that fascinating glimpse into the kind of discovery process that was made in interviewing all these people and thinking about the unique place that our town occupies in, in the American canon of plays. And, and it is true that I think almost when you sit down to watch our town, you forget that Act Three is going to happen. There's something about the surprise that is built into the play dramaturgically that Wilder is designing it this way. Uh, so that it sneaks up on you and you are left uh, completely vulnerable to what is about to happen at the end of the play. I, I feel like we're we're talking in very druidical terms about this saint-like experience. So I'm trying not to mystify our town, but it is there is something uh, to that idea. Uh, and you also talked about the fact that this is a play that has been and will be and can be done in a variety of different, even opposing ways. And that tapping uh, has a very liberal attitude as the executor of the Wilder Estate to how it is done, which leads me naturally, I think, to you, Alan, as the director of this production of Our Town. I'm really curious to hear, first of all, I love hearing about process. So, you know, where are you right now in the process and what are you working on currently? But also, how did you approach uh, this play, which has been done so many different ways, seemingly an inexhaustible number of times, uh, in the less than a hundred years since it was written, um, how did you decide to bring it to the stage and fully realize it for a, a new production? Well, um, we're in the middle of act three and we spent the, the morning on act three, which is just a very interesting thing to work on. I don't think you were in the room, Craig, but you know, they say in the script that the dead don't stay interested in us long. And there's a particular note because there's dead people on the stage that they, they need to be matter of fact and they can't be lugubrious and they can't be in a dead person's voice. And so we've been working out how, and they're sitting in expectation of what's to come. So they don't look active, but they are because they're busy waiting for the better part of them to burn off, for them to become their essential selves. So, you know, and then they talk about life as if they were alive. And, and the, the, the interesting thing about the play and especially about Act Three is that the sentiment that people put on it kills it. And it's so hard to just get those actors to, to trust not being sentimental. And it, Act Three is a great example because the dead don't care about the living and their stupid problems. And when Emily who arrives into the land of the dead learns that she's better off. But it's, so it's, it's been very interesting to work on that and they're all doing an amazing job. Um, the play itself, I mean, I, I didn't know it that well. I saw David Cromer's production in New York, which I loved. Um, and, you know, during the pandemic, I thought for a long time about what I wanted to do to come back. And uh, I looked at um, so many of my friends that are actors in DC were out of work and there was nowhere to go and the theaters just couldn't hire people. And um, 
so I thought, number one, it wouldn't it be great to do a play about community. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great to make it about our community and to put all of the, the best actors I could find in, in the show. So more than a concept, the impetus was just that. And I think that the play is epically simple and we're doing it um, much more simply than, than even other productions because I don't want ladders in the show. I wanna get rid of that iconic image. I don't want trellises, I don't, I don't have benches. I just have two tables and some chairs. And we've made the decision also to do the play in the round in the Harmon, um, which I, I don't believe we've ever been fully in the round before. So um, it's, I've been in the theater to check on it. We'll move to the theater to start technical rehearsals on Friday. Um, but I thought it was important that the audience be able to see each other and that it felt like a communal event and that's been really fun to stage in the round. And also I was saying earlier to Howard, it's been interesting because in a proscenium, you have the two wives shelling the beans and they sit next to each other, but you can't sit next to each other in the round. You have to be on a diagonal, you have to be spread out. And the same is true for the soda shop where they sit next to each other. And the moment you sit next to each other in the round, you're blocking people on other sides your back is to the audience. And, and so it's been a really interesting negotiation of how to uh, put this really intimate thing in the round, keep it moving, but also keep it really intimate. And that's been a, a fun challenge for me. So in other words, uh, it truly is our town, this production of our town. It, it, it is uh, the, the community of, the theatrical community of Washington, DC will be represented in some ways for the first time since the shutdown happened, uh, even though like the theaters have reopened, uh, there's there's a kind of desire to keep things local uh, and to remind people of all these familiar faces uh, that we haven't been seeing enough on our stages, which I think is, uh, is, is a really powerful idea, just me talking about it uh, right now. And also this idea of putting it in the round. I mean, I've heard, I haven't seen the this, this, this set yet in the Harmon, but I, I hear it's a remarkable transformation of, this, of the space that in some ways, like the play is something that has to be seen and experienced to be believed. So yeah, I'm very excited for the next step of the show as it as it makes its way into the space and as that part of the process uh, happens. Uh, Craig, I'm interested in hearing your perspective as an actor in the show and as someone who has experience uh, with our town. Uh, how has this process been unique uh, or or different from maybe our towns in the past? And also this question that occurs to me, because I was in New York a couple of weeks ago and I saw Skin of Our Teeth, uh, which is the third of Wilder's Pulitzer Prize winning works. And the question of acting style came up for me in Thornton Wilder, because it's not really naturalism. Uh, it's not necessarily as broad as musical theater. It feels like there's a simplicity, an epically simple uh, approach, as Alan Paul might say, to steal a, a piquant phrase. Like, I'm curious as an actor, like, are there any stylistic touchstones that you reach for when you're working on the show? I know you, you were saying before we went on air that you read Howard's book as a kind of like clue into the play. Um, but yeah, how do you approach acting in a, in a wilder play and in our town specifically? Well, the, we, we certainly used Howard's book because the play is, you know, so subject to interpretation that it was great to see what other people you know, had done and and how they approached it. Um, I think I think cleanliness is the best way to describe the style of, of this piece. Uh, you don't have to put a lot on it. You just have to be in the moment. And as uh, as Alan alluded to, and and what so many people say about the piece is that uh, sentimentality, preciousness, is sort of death for the piece. And what's so interesting to me is that uh, working on it. I, I'm wondering why we would even go there because the play is so active. The stage manager is inviting us to ponder and consider and and regard. And all of that stuff is active. All of that is not sitting back and say, let's remember what a good time is. She's constantly asking us questions and um, which 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 leads us to that third act that we all been talking about um, where where we really have to face um, that third act of our lives. Um, so it's been great for me to revisit the play. I always love to revisit plays because I think I, I find, especially doing Shakespeare, because, you know, there's only 
X amount of them. So we tend to do them again and again. But every time we go back to them, it's an opportunity to learn more about the language, learn more about the world, learn more about relationships. So I'm, I'm enjoying going back to the play and trying to rediscover what the life of not only uh, Editor Webb is, but you know, the whole, you know, the whole piece, the whole journey of where we want to take the audience. Yeah, a cleanliness, simplicity, and yet in that is a complexity that is hard to put your finger on. Um, and well, I, I will, re re yeah, correct. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, what what's magical about the piece is that the complexity arises out of that simplicity. Right. Exactly. That if we put too much on it, if we start acting, then somehow we're robbing people of really discovering. And, and 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 that's a you know that's something that we that's what we've been doing in rehearsal is you know we come in we come in with homework with choices and then alan goes yes or no or uh, you know he calibrates that whole journey so that so that what lies before people is an unfolding of these three acts and uh, I will remind our viewers that Sierra is monitoring the chat. So if there are questions or comments that you want to ask our panelists, uh, uh, she is able to uh, ask those, pose them to us all live right now. So, so maybe Sierra might, might choose one or two of those. But I also want to ask a follow-up question uh, to Howard, but also to the group. Um, this idea of our town and how it speaks to American culture. Like, how do you think our town has infiltrated the culture and how does it continue to infiltrate the culture? You mentioned Howard, the 2002 production on Broadway, which, you know, I was alive. I didn't, I didn't see that production, but I know it was one of the first productions after 9-11 uh, that seemed to speak to a larger truth about society in America and what was happening in the world. So how does our town function as a kind of reflection of a changing America? I'm curious if there are any discoveries you made along those lines. Well, I'm going to immediately broaden it. And I say, I think that Wilder was after something that was more than America. He may have been an American writing and setting it in America, but this play would not live the way it does internationally if, if he didn't tap into something that is, that is international. I'm not going to say universal, but I will definitely say international in the same way that Alan came upon the idea of wanting this to be a play for Washington with the Washington community performing in it. Uh, one of the first professional productions of the play after pandemic shutdowns was the Queensland Theatre Company in Australia, companies in Australia reopened their first in performance uh, production was our town and they had an indigenous Australian man playing the stage manager. And what does it mean for this play to be in that country? I don't think he, he, he his examples may have been American, but I think that what he was so shrewd about and uh, Wilder and he acknowledged, he acknowledged uh, Greek theater influences. He acknowledged Asian theater influences that, that he synthesized a whole lot of ideas and he synthesized ideas that are in many major religions, but without much of the, of the actual detail of the religions so that he could fashion something that spoke, spoke to everybody. Um, and, and again, to why does the play live? I don't think this play would live. I don't think it would live internationally. Uh, if if it if it didn't transcend, and of course we all know of other examples of plays that may be written about specific places in specific times. Why was Fiddler on the Roof such a hit in so many different places? You know, places that didn't have necessarily even have a Jewish population to speak of, because it tapped into into that core for for everyone. So I think. I think the danger, and, and again, where people fall into the trap of sentimentality is they, I think they now fixate on when they see the years 1901, 1904, and they think, oh, it has to be petticoats, and oh, it has to be trellises. And, and if we focus on those details, the phylo system of raising chickens, the refilling trough on, on the farm, 
then we're probably focusing on the wrong parts of the play. Those are just there to serve as some details of life so that it was not so generic as to be undefined. But, but the real focus is about something that's much greater uh, than, than something as, as particular as America, to be American, to be Americana. And Wilder even makes a point of putting in things. People want to say that Grover's Corners was an, was an all white town. Well, we may not know of, of black uh, or, or Asian residents in the town, but we do know that there are immigrants in Grover's Corners. We're talking about an era in which Catholics were not part of the mainstream, certainly in that part of the United States. There is just constant reminders that there is a broader world. And while what we may, the little sliver of Grover's Corners we may have seen in 1938 was narrow, it expands enormously and can be expanded in productions without, without having to change a word. Uh, yeah, Craig, you have a you have a response. I'm curious to hear. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, um, as an actor of color, I, especially uh, uh, as much classical work as I do, I, I often have to ask myself, where would where do I fit? How do I, as a person of color, fit in this production? And you know, one of the things that I've learned about our town is that the geography is specific, but the human condition is universal. And so the things that Editor Webb feels, his relationship to his daughter, all of that is age old and worldwide. So I can, I can embrace being the editor of Grover's Corners because I'm living his spirit. I'm living his life. I'm living his objective, his needs, his wants. And the idea that it's coming from the lens or the voice of a person of color doesn't bother me. And I think, I, and my hope is that my commitment to it, it doesn't bother uh, the the audience, <laughs> although you know there's no guarantee, but uh, that's our hope. Well, and also you know hearing hearing you, Craig and Howard talk about the 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 universality to be found within the specific. I think it's also interesting how Wilder sprinkles into the play uh, acknowledgments of the kind of flux of history and the flux of time. I mean, at one point, the stage manager trots out a kind of scientist to give a history of Grover's Corners. And there is an acknowledgement of the indigenous population that was driven out uh, by white Anglo-Saxons and then the influx of immigrants, right? The sense that this is a place that has changed in its composition and will continue to change over the course of time. Yes, Howard. The mention of, of the indigenous Americans is actually a callous mention because it simply refers to them as being all gone now, which is an old way. Well, they're not, they weren't simply gone, they were driven away. But that character is, is sort of fussy and fastidious and dull and unaware. And, and that Wilder even built that in as, as something, they're these constant, one of the, one of the fascinating things, and, and again, I am, I am just the repository of what a hundred plus people told me about the play. And I continue to learn about the play from people like Alan and Craig and others, because people keep making discoveries, is, is that there's the, the, de the closer you look at our town, which seems very simple, there is so much there and even, even little passing mentions in the play have meaning. How many times do we hear about war in our town? How many times do we hear about lives lost in war? Well, I have to remember, this was a play written, it was actually finished by Wilder. He's largely working on it in Europe in 1937 before it was produced. Well, what was going on in Europe in 1937? He knew about the rise of the Nazis. He didn't take it on directly, but this is actually a play that is in response to a growing horror in the world. And at the same time, he also has somebody stand up from the audience and ask if people, isn't anyone aware of social, in, social injustice and social inequity? That's not a new line. That's not something that got thrust in because Alan decided he wanted the production to be woke. 
that's actually a concern that has always been present in this play. And again, the fact that, frankly, no offense, Craig, Editor Webb doesn't have a great answer for that. He's a little, it, it's not, it's not a perfect answer. It's, and, and that's where the play to me grows more and more interesting. And I have to say, having been looking at it pretty hard now for about three years, the fact that I can still look at it and, and, and question and grapple and wonder says to me, this is, it's not a simple play at all. It's, it's, it's a deep play. And while it may, it may be easy to let it pass by you and just ride the emotion and ride the, the simple part, look deeper in our town. There is so much in this play. And there's also, correct me if I'm wrong, Howard, because you, you spent more time with the play uh, than, than I have probably. Uh, isn't there also a reference to the Daughters of the American Revolution and a kind of strain of American nativism? And the stage manager says, oh yeah, there's yes. always some kind of nonsense like that going on. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, there there is is that. I mean, there's there is disdain. There's disdain for the the uh, sacrament of marriage. When when the stage manager steps into the role of the minister, he questions uh, this whole issue of of people as the place is marching into the grave two by two. And what is a sacrament? I'm not sure I understand. Most of the time, these weddings aren't all that interesting. So, so there's, there's even skepticism about our institutions built into this play. It is not, as, and I, I say this over and over again, people think of it and remember it as being some kind of a sepia tone picture postcard to the past. And if you really engage with the play, it's anything but that. This is a play that is constantly reminding you of lives, lost, lives wasted, people ignored, um, and all, all with a very singular goal. I think it is a play that wants you to take away one thing. And again, from, from the way all the people that I talked to, wherever they came to this play from, people all tend to go away from it thinking the same thing. It's just a question of how you get them there. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, I, I'm very excited to talk about these nerdy uh, uh, things, uh, these details uh, in the play uh, dramaturgically. But we do want to announce uh, our upcoming shows uh, for the Shakespeare Hour Live for the rest of the season. And uh, I believe, Gordon, we may have some slides uh, that we can show our audience right now as I make this uh, ad, this commercial jingle. Uh, this is the first, as I said at the top of the show, of two episodes on Thornton Wilder's work this month. Please join us in two weeks on May 18th, when we will be discussing Wilder's work more broadly with the famous Tappan Wilder, Thornton's nephew, and perhaps the greatest living expert on all things Wilder. This will be a very special free episode of the Shakespeare Hour Live. So tell all of your friends as it will be featuring the world premiere of a brand new documentary on Wilder's work and life uh, commissioned by the Wilder family followed by a special talk with Tappan and guests. So you really don't want to miss this. And on Wednesday, July 13th, we will be discussing Lolita Chakrabarti's play, Red Velvet, about the life and work of the great Shakespearean actor, Ira Aldridge. We hope to see all of you with us here on Zoom as we explore the rest of the shows in this season further. Um, so now um, I'm curious, Sierra, you know, you're monitoring the chat, you're seeing comments, questions, and uh, do you have any that you can share, uh, reflections that you can share with our panelists and maybe like a question or two uh, that, that we could pose to the group? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of our audience members are finding that like myself, they are our town first timers. Um, and one of our viewers, Robin Swope asks, for those who are familiar with the play, is it better to have some knowledge before seeing it or to go in knowing nothing. So I wonder if our panelists have any advice for Robin. I think that's an interesting question. Should one read the play uh, before going in to see it or should one go in blind as it I were? I wonder, that. Alan, yeah, could you answer that question? The answer is no. Come with fresh eyes and be surprised. It'll take you somewhere different than you might think. 
I envy anyone who gets to see this for the first time and doesn't know where it's going. I would I would agree with that. And, uh, you know, it's a play that it's 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 in a sense, it's impossible to spoil our town because it is looking at life from all these different uh, facets and in all these different dimensions. And yet at the same time, there is a magic to not knowing what's going to happen uh, from one moment to the next of the play. So please, Robin, please go in completely fresh and then tell us what you think. Uh, I, I wonder, Craig or Howard, do you have any uh, further opinions on this question? One hundred Please. No, no, 100% agree. Don't, don't read it. Don't watch it. Don't watch the movie. Don't watch the 1940 movie. Don't ever watch the 1940 movie. And I was just going to say, we have all you need. We really do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've, we've actually, uh, I believe that our marketing department is going to allow people to take selfies on the stage for this production. There's going to be a, a selfie corner on the stage of our art town. So, so come see the show and then take a picture of yourself on the stage uh, if you want to. Uh, there's immersive quality to this production. Um, that's very interesting. Well, I also know that we always love to share passages of text to actually look at the object itself as well as talk about it. Uh, so I'm wondering if like, uh, you know, all of our panelists have uh, pulled uh, a section or a passage of either Wilder's words or or something else in relation to the play, uh, which we could hear maybe and then talk about. So I'm wondering, Craig, uh, since you know the play so well and since you know the character of Editor Webb so well, I'm really curious to hear what you've chosen for us tonight. Well, I'm uh, I'm actually going to read a stage manager piece. Uh, Great. I think that's something for us to talk about now. Um, I have, I am not, nor have never been the stage manager. So um, I'm going to read this with feeling, but cold. So, but I got you covered. So this is, uh, this is one of the second or third uh, stage manager speeches in our town. I think this is a good time to tell you that the Cartwright interests have just begun building a new bank in Grover's Corners, had to go to Vermont for the marble, sorry to say. And they've asked a friend of mine what they should put in the cornerstone for people to dig up a thousand years from now. Of course, they've put a copy of the New York Times and a copy of Mr. Webb's Sentinel. We're kind of interested in this because some scientific fellas have found a way of painting all that reading matter with a glue, a silicate glue that that'll make it keep a thousand, two thousand years. We're putting in a Bible and the Constitution of the United States and a copy of William Shakespeare's plays. What do you say, folks? What do you think? So I, I chose that because one of the things that strikes me as we rehearse the play is when the stage manager asks us questions. What do you think about that? What does that mean to you? I find I found myself in the read through actually contemplating that as as Craig, like, wow, what do I think about that? Which is what I love so much about uh, our approach and the approach of Holly Twyford, who's our stage manager. You know, we're constantly asking people to consider, to think about, to regard, um, and 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 I think that's where the wonder of this play lies. The play. Our design is simple, or I should say subtle, uh, because it's certainly certainly there to, to, uh, to be the foundation for the storytellers who have to lift this stuff to pull people in to things for them to regard, to think about. So that's, that's, I chose that because I love when the stage manager asks us questions. Yeah, and it makes it makes me think of what would we put in a time capsule yes. today that was going to be uh, remembered a hundred years from now. Uh, and you know, the play itself is a kind of time capsule in a sense, not to be corny and metaphorical here. Uh, but Wilder was so interested in the properties of the theater that it happens live, and it it happens in the present moment, and it well, is a reflection I... of the current historical and political and social moment as well as when it was written. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. And I, I didn't want to butcher any more of the text, but <laughs> toward the end of this speech, she says, I'm going to put a copy of this play into the cornerstone. 
So, you know, I mean, that's even that is poignant in and of itself. That, uh, that it's... a part a part of this history, a part of what we're experiencing is going to go into the cornerstone for future generations to regard. Right. And, and the fact that we're all in a theater experiencing it together, like we are experiencing this moment that will be gone uh, as soon as we leave the theater. Right. We'll go, go our separate ways. Uh, Sierra, you're telling me that there's a question for Craig in the chat. This is very exciting. Yes, it's actually one I'm curious um, to find the answer out to. Um, could Craig perhaps speak more to the impact of working with members of the DC acting community for this play? Well, it's fantastic. And it's it's uh, it was the best play for me to come back to the stage after almost three years of the pandemic. Um, most of these actors, most all of them, are, are, are both friends and dear colleagues that I've worked with for several, several years, So, uh, including Alan. So we walk into the process with a trust, with, with, uh, with a desire to lift each other up, uh, to challenge each other, all of that. Like we didn't need a week to get to know each other. We already knew each other. And those that we didn't knew, no, we took under our wing and said, here, here, let's go, trust us, go with us. So it's been, it like I said, it was the perfect way for me to make my way back onto the stage. And Alan, I'm curious to hear your passage of text as well, but also, you know, your thoughts on, on being part of this, gathering this kind of community of DC actors together and what that has been like for you. Well, it's been, it's been the craziest experience I've ever had because the people watching will know that this production was supposed to happen in February and March. And just four days before the first rehearsal, we made the difficult, but I think smart decision to postpone it because of Omicron. And um, at first I was really worried because people planned their years and a lot of people were not available to do this play now, including Holly, um, who is directing a play at Signature Theater, which opens this week. And I just sort of thought there's no reason to do the play. I mean, there's not, not a reason to do the play, but the whole point of this production was as described. And so people made a lot of sacrifices to change their schedules. So everyone, was available in this April and, and May, but that's meant dealing with an extraordinary amount of conflicts, um, people gone for days at a time. We had the full company at the first read through um, in April. And the next time we will have the full company is the final dress rehearsal. And the only reason we've been able to pull it off and to work kind of wildly out of order and you know with the revolving door is because everyone knows each other. So people, including um, Kim Schraff, who's playing the professor, is understudying Holly. And so when Holly is not in rehearsal, Kim is there doing it just as well. And so it's been a kind of magic experiment in can we do it? And the answer is, I think we can. Um, in terms of passages, I mean, I think what Howard said is so interesting earlier that the, he introduced, Thornton Wilder introduces a wedding to show skepticism about religion and about what is underneath um, a wedding. Underneath a wedding is confusion. And that's what you see is a very fractured wedding. He also in the, in the third act uh, with the presence of the dead and what they say shows you that what the dead actually feel is quite different than what the living feel at a funeral. So Thornton Wilder is unpacking what we believe are the major moments of life and showing us that they're actually have quite a different thing underneath them. And the, the uh, stage manager as the, uh, the preacher at the end of the wedding, the, the, they've just married, George and Emily are, uh, have just kissed and time stops. And there's a tableau and the stage manager has, steps out of it to comment on the action and says, I've married over 200 couples in my day. Do I believe in it? I don't know. M marries N, millions of them the cottage, the go-kart, the Sunday afternoon drives in the Ford, the first rheumatism, the grandchildren, the second rheumatism, the deathbed, the reading of the will. Well, once in a thousand times, it's interesting. 
I mean, first of all, it reminds me of the seven ages of man's speech in a way, but like this preacher who just doesn't, uh, doesn't even know if she believes in religion at all or the concept of marriage is like, what an interesting injection. And also, you know, we, we go to a wedding when we want to cry because our friends are marrying each other and the precious couple that was meant for each other. And the way Thornton Wilder describes it is M marries N. There is something so impersonal and so predictable about all the phases of life that feel so personal to us and are not at all from, you know, a wedding to life and death. And I think it's sort of amazing that, that that's his conclusion. And also M. Mary Zen was a working title of the piece at one point and he changed it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I think quite <laughs> fascinating and, um, and wild and cynical and real and pragmatic. And it's a, it's a lot of things in that. Yeah, and uh, thank God in a sense that he changed it because I, I much prefer our town to M. Mary's N. M. Mary's N is difficult to say, for one, all those M's. Uh, but also, you know, like there's something about the mundane everyday experiences of life that I always leave our town appreciating anew, right? Well, that Wilder is yeah. pouring scorn on, on these big ceremonial occasions and I certainly, you know, have horrible memories of getting married myself. It was one of the most stressful days of my life. Uh, and yet every day since, I am grateful that I got married, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And on the way to the altar, George has a nervous breakdown. And yeah. he almost doesn't go through with it. Emily says, I hate him when she sees him. I wish I were dead. And then a moment later, Craig's character, Editor Webb, who's Emily's father, gets them together and essentially marries them in the hall or gets them to commit to each other before the actual ceremony. Um, but, but at the center of this love fest, I think you, you would be hard pressed to find any bride or groom or situation where, especially in a young marriage where that was not the case, maybe in, a, in an older marriage or an elopement, but in a real wedding, traditional wedding, I, I can't think of anyone who hasn't felt some version of that. Yeah, it's an extraordinary uh, sequence in the play. Um, uh, and you know, Howard, I'm curious maybe for your thoughts on that, on that sequence, but also for the, the passage that you uh, would like to share with our viewers. Well, I think I've already spoken to the, the fact that the play is very careful, that there are, there are flies in the ointment in this play. It is, not, it is not perfect and life is difficult and it may have been what we perceive of as a simpler time because of where we are today. And I'm sure if people watch plays about today, a hundred years from now, it will seem a simpler time then. It was always a simpler time. It doesn't mean it was necessarily an easier time. And it doesn't mean that there weren't doubts in those times too. Um, I, I thought it would be rather fulsome of me to, to try to read a passage from the play. I'm not an actor. And, and don't pretend to be one. So if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to read a brief bit from the conclusion of, of my introduction. Uh, again, because there are greater minds than mine who have spent much time reading about this play. Um, in a conversation with Gregory Mosier, who directed the 1988 Broadway production of Our Town, which falls outside the time frame of this book, he drew distinct parallels between Wilder and Samuel Beckett, between Our Town and Waiting for Godot. Wilder anticipates the deaths of 60 million, said Mosher. Beckett responds to the deaths of 60 million people. He went on to further illuminate the connection, first by quoting Beckett. They give birth astride of a grave, the light gleams an instant, and then it's night once more. That's the plot of, to the degree that there's plot, which isn't much, of our town. Mosher went on to call our town a shocking play, a deeply shocking play, the greatest American play, perhaps, because of what it takes on. Mosher elaborated, observing, if one of the questions of the play is not only people die, but that civilizations die, 2020 seems like a very good time to be doing the play. What are the many reasons we keep returning to this bare sliver of life at the turn of the 20th century? How does a play set in what was most assuredly an all-white, patriarchal, Protestant, semi-rural, small town in New England manage to speak to audiences more than 80 years on? It ain't houses, and it ain't names, and it ain't earth, and it ain't even the stars, wrote Wilder. Perhaps 
that something has to do with human beings. For this most produced of American classics, there is always another day begun and another truth to be discovered. Yeah, bravo. Yeah, it certainly. I uh, can't wait to read the book, Howard, uh, and to, to, to discover insights like that on every page. But, it, you know, it's true hearing Alan talk about the difficulties of even just rehearsing this play uh, in a time when uh, logistically it's complicated uh, because of this pandemic that we are still in the midst of and this kind of marathon that has been the last two or three years. Um, in an odd way, it puts us very much in the right frame of mind for what Wilder's writing about in this play and in, in the broadest uh, sense. You know, he was writing at a time, uh, as you say, of emergency, of worldwide emergency, of rising uh, fascism in Europe uh, and kind of predicting what was to come and also looking at what had been over the last 60 years and trying to find a meaning, sifting through it for all the meaning. I mean, in, a, in, a, in a, a certain sense, we all die, and that gives a shape and a meaning to our lives. But what is that meaning, I think, is one of the questions that our town poses. And it's a very, it's a very interesting question, and it's a very difficult one in some ways to answer, but a very profound one, I think, uh, whenever you see this, this play. Um, I'm not asking questions now. I am just uh, musing philosophically, waxing poetic, as Thornton Wilder is wont to make one uh, do. I'm wondering if there are any final words that uh, you want to leave our audiences with uh, tonight, Howard. Just experience it and let it flow over you when, whenever you have the chance to encounter it, uh, ideally live in a theater. It's, it's not a piece that works perfectly on screen. It's, it's definitely a, a theater experience. And, and I often say, part of the greatest impact of our town is that by being as spare as it is, by being the shaker version of playwriting, just simple, clean lines, I think many of us end up projecting our own lives onto our town, and that is how, where it gets its greatest power, not simply from the great words of Thornton Wilder, but from what is already within us that it draws out of us. Mm, yeah, wonderful. And Craig and Alan, I'm wondering if you have any uh, final thoughts you'd, you'd wish to share. Alan? I'm getting the, the motion from Craig. Um, I mean, it's about the macro and the micro. I mean, it's everything and nothing. It's um, the challenge and the fun of directing it is that he's trying to capture the idea that the fullest part of life is in the smallest moments. And how you direct that is very tricky because the moment you overlay a moment uh, and make it more than what it is, it's artificial. But the moment that you, it doesn't feel important or special, then you wonder why Thornton Wilder has selected that scene to be in the play. So it's just a dance in terms of style and content and um, it's a wonderful, wonderful challenge. And it's been a great challenge to find the style. We talked about that earlier. I think I named last week that I want to call it heightened realism. And Thornton Wilder talks a lot in the play. In the, there's a letter he wrote where he's complaining about the first production and a director who had mishandled the play and his notes about it, that, that people... Uh, we're talking the same way to each other when they're outdoors as when they're indoors. And he uses a term called nervous compression, that there is a nervous compression of the play. So when you see a small scene that appears to be about nothing, it is always about something else. And so it, it's sort of, you can see the influence of Chekhov in there and, you know, what is on the language, what is between the lines and, I hope to to get all of that um, into it. I think the the um, the reason to do a classic is you know you measure the wall of your own talent by seeing how you handle uh, a play against history. And so I'm just sort of excited and intimidated to continue our journey with this great piece of writing to see at the theater. Mm. 
Yeah, why, why, wonderful words. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us on this really uh, fascinating conversation uh, that certainly uh, shed new light on our town, a fascinating play for me. Uh, our town begins preview performances in Sydney Harmon Hall on May 12th, and the opening night is May 17th, so right around the corner. And for our next show, the night after opening, as I mentioned before, May 18th, please join us for the Shakespeare Hour Live free featuring the world premiere of a new documentary on Wilder's work and life. We'll be joined by Tappan Wilder, Rosie Strub of the Wilder Estate, and the scholar Stephen Rojevich, Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland College Park. Thank you again, and good night to all. Mm-hmm.